Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Uh, yeah, it's great to be in our new abode, CMC Expanding, and happy that uh, some of you who dug quite deep into their pockets in order to make it possible for us to buy this uh, really essential extension to our uh, little burgeoning empire um, are able to be with us today. Uh, we're now able to host events like this in-house uh, and to expand into the various other spaces of this building, which probably you've already had a prowl around to see uh, what new possibilities are being opened up. And downstairs will be, uh, inshallah, the new library, one of our pet projects, bringing books in from different corners of the CMC campus to put them all together in one place where they belong with uh, a proper librarian's checkout system uh, to make sure the books that mysteriously dematerialize from our shelves uh, can be tracked down. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to be working through some books which uh, are in our library uh, today. Inshallah, I'll be talking about uh, Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha, radiallahu anha, uh, basing myself on some of the underestimated resources uh, that the Muslim world has produced. Very often, uh, Western accounts of aspects of the seerah, especially areas of the seerah that we might be touching on today, which have been contested or which seem surprising, uh, have been uh, dominated by a certain outsider's approach that tends to marginalize the, as it were, sacred or religious dimension, leading to stories that seem rather flat, rather, rather dusty rather strange sometimes. So I'm going to be basing myself today on original sources uh, from our Arabic collection. Let me just talk briefly about where I'm going to be speaking from today. Um, one writer who we've already used once or twice in this paradigm series is uh, Al-Aqad, the Egyptian uh, polymath of the mid-20th century from Aswan, uh, who wrote quite a bit about uh, key figures in the, uh, the Sira, his four books on the four khulafa are still really popular. So this is his book, um, which he calls as siddiqa bint as siddiq uh, Then also, another person that we've used, another Egyptian, uh, Aisha Abdurrahman bint as um, I used her approach when I was speaking a couple of years ago now about uh, Sayyidah Sukaina uh, bint al Hussein. She has a book about him. Uh, she was a professor at Cairo University, a uh, tafsir expert, historian, um, and her perspective is quite refreshing as somebody who is a kind of an Arab Muslim believing woman who's also an academic, a, a useful foil to uh, the uh, sometimes rather flagrant biases of an outsider orientalist approach. So, this is a chapter in her book, Nisa and Nebi, The Wives of the Prophet. And then another book, perhaps a little bit less well known, but which uh, is really very thorough as a historian's accomplishment, Sa'id al Afghani, Aisha wa Siyasa, Aisha and Politics, looking not so much at the devotional, hadith, wifely side of her career, but specifically at uh, her uh, engagement with the, as we know, very turbulent politics of the time. So um, those will be some of my sources, but also um, Sira and so forth, trying to get back to the original sources, looking at it from the perspective of how it was understood by Muslims at the time, rather than on the basis of you know, what Western elites might regard as uh, a normative approach in the year 2023, which is uh, anachronistic and tends to detract from this aspect of the, the sanctity of the story of the emergence of the new world religion. One thing, however, where these uh, modern Middle Eastern scholars and theologians kind of agree with an Orientalist Western professorial approach is their awareness of the titanic importance of the background of tribalism in Arabia. Sometimes we tend to underestimate that aspect of the Jahiliyyah we think of the Jahiliyyah as a time when everybody's wandering around on 
uh, leek camels reciting amazing poetry and then going off to worship gods of various improbable kinds. And uh, the, the main feature of the Jahiliya, which kind of uh, becomes a real possibility for people to revert to in the first couple of centuries of Islam, is the tribalism, the ethnocentrism. So no, nobody was any longer uh, paying tribute to Hubal or Al-Lat or Al-Ozza. Al uh, that was uh, uh, put a stop to. But the tribal affiliation, the desire to be with kith and kin as a rival to the new religious dispensation is something that uh, was very important at the time and will help us to understand certain aspects, particularly of the political career of um, uh, Siddhartha Aisha, radiallahu anha. Uh, one of the titanic challenges which the Holy Prophet faced uh, was not only to change the kind of metaphysical belief system of uh, his people, uh, but also to deal with the way in which they organised their society. For who knows how many tens of thousands of years, Arabia had been this pocket of hunter-gatherer, uh, nomads and semi-nomadic populations in a largely uncultivable, really vast, inhospitable area where tribal solidarity was essential for personal survival. And everything in your life was determined by your tribe and which family and which clan you existed uh, in within each tribe. That was your identity. You said, Ana Tamimi, min Batan, Bakr bin Wa'il, or whatever it was, and everybody immediately knew everything about you. That was your whole world, your horizon. It was the basis for your moral behavior. It was the basis for your marriage plans. It was the basis for how much authority you would be, receive in the councils of the tribe. Uh, everything was determined on these ultimately accidents of birth. And this is the Hamiyat al Jahiliya, when the Qur'an warns people of possibly being influenced by the, the feverishness. Hamiyat is kind of like a feverish group solidarity, fanaticism for kith and kin. Uh, it is referring specifically to this ethnocentrism rather than to fanaticism for idols or for some of their beliefs or lack of beliefs about life after death. It's a major aspect of the prophetic revolution and a really challenging one. And you can't really understand early Islamic history and the titanic, sometimes calamitous events that happened then when you, unless you understand how people are trying to negotiate family with the new disposition of religion, which meant that in all significant things, in this new thing called the Sharia, it didn't really matter a whole lot, you know, what social class you were from, what region you were from. Bilal could marry an aristocratic, pale-skinned Arab woman, and the Holy Prophet did it, and it was just fine. This was a, an incredible uh, insurrection against the way in which they had been for, you know, since time immemorial. And in order to understand a lot of the early factionalism, sectarian tendencies, different caliphal allegiances in the first century, you have to understand who are Bani Umayya, who are Bani al-Abbas, who are these various groups. Why is it that the Khawarij come primarily from the Tamim tribe in Central Arabia? The tribe is behind a lot of these things, and because it's not really much in our world, we tend not to realize what a, a titanic transformation this was. If the Holy Prophet وسلم, confronted with the building of Arabian society, which had been there forever, was saying it has to be completely rebuilt from the ground up. Certain virtues can continue, hospitality, generosity, and so forth, horsemanship, those things are fine. But the basic mortar which holds together the mansion of Arab society is all taken out, the tribal thing, and replaced with something else. In the Akramakum, Aindallah Atqaqum, the noblest of you in Allah's sight is he who has most taqwa. And this was an idea that really blew the minds of very many in his time. And uh, in order to understand something like the family of the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the multiple wives, you have to understand each one of them is from a particular tribal uh, constellation or galaxy. And each one of those marriages has a political dimension. 
know, there's the love dimension as well, and affinity and those things, but the politics can't be excluded. In the pre-modern world, generally, uh, people in positions of authority formed dynastic marriages. That was the case with the British royal family, really, until the time of uh, Queen Victoria or even later. Marriage was an opportunity to overcome conflict. So Montgomery Watt, who's one of the best-known Western writers on the Sira, his book, Muhammad at Mecca, Muhammad in Medina, is all about the tribes, and he goes through all of these really boring genealogies. Uh, and his view is that every single one of the marriages of the Holy Prophet is a political marriage. And he explains she's from this tribe, and this averted this conflict, and this was one way in which Arabia was united. And again, in our culture, you know, when we're all addicted to rom-coms and chick flicks and whatever it is that gives us our idea of boy meets girl. This is a very different world. Uh, this is a world in which there are questions of survival, questions of building a new polity and things necessarily looked different. So to understand a story like this, we have to tweeze our hearts out of the sort of sentimental world of the 21st century where Hollywood has really shaped or misshaped our, our understandings and get into a different idea, uh, a different context. Um, another aspect is, of course, that um, certainly these authors, and Aqad in particular, um, talks about what he calls al-unuthatul khalida, <laughs> the eternal feminine. Nowadays, we don't like gender essences. Mm. Uh, Keir Starmer can't define what is a woman. He look, goes into his usual kind of gormless slightly annoyed face and what is a woman oh, well, it's really difficult to try something about the economy please so it's, it's an age in which we are kind of our understandings which went back hundred thousand years about what is male what is female are breaking down in a very radical way and even the older feminist understanding which is based on women being a certain thing because they had to be a certain thing if they were to talk about equality if they don't really exist as Summer says how can you have equality between things that don't exist. So it's a kind of meltdown phase for the West in its ascertaining of uh, the nature of gender. And this can't be a lecture about gender, that's a whole different thing. But it may well be as we move through uh, this story of a really different time uh, with these amazing personalities that our understanding of uh, what gender is will be enriched a little bit. Is uh, Akkad right to say that there is the eternal feminine. There is a female essence, a female temperament. A lot of uh, uh, geneticists will say, well, yes, obviously. Um, but a certain cultural pushback against that has led us to our current strange situation in our world, uh, where we know so much about science and biology and DNA and chromosomes and hormones, but still uh, we can't define these fundamental things. So you have 12-year-old boys going to the GP, not having to tell their parents, saying, I think I'm a girl. And the GP, even 10 years ago, would have said, well, in what way? Because even then there was a sense that girls are a certain kind of thing and they like certain things. Now he can't say that because that's essentialism and stereotyping. So all he can do is to say to this confused boy, uh, does your understanding of what it is to be a woman coincide with your understanding of yourself? This 12-year-old is supposed to crack this deep philosophical question that's caused a civil war between J.K. Rowling and The Guardian, and it's kind of, it's led to all kinds of strangenesses. So one of the advantages of the Sira is that it does give us some very strong feminine personalities and some very clear heroic masculine personalities not as a kind of ideology, but just as examples. And one thing that we need to think about in connection with this is that these women are really, and this is not some kind of modern feministic reinterpretation, obviously at the centre of the story. Whereas Wajuhu Ummahatuhum, Allah himself says it, his wives are their mothers, mothers of the believers, matriarchs. They have authority. 
a natural authority in fiqh, in wisdom, in deference. So you have this unique situation amongst major world religions where the inner circle is kind of women. Christ has his 12 disciples. To the dismay of feminists, they're all male. Uh, the Holy Prophet's inner circle, you could, from a certain perspective, you could say it's his family, it's his women and his daughters because he doesn't have sons who, who live. Uh, there's a real kind of accumulation of, of women, amazing women, at the centre. And another thing we see is that even though Aqad can talk about the eternal feminine, Aisha is not Umm Habiba, Aisha is not Khadija, Aisha is not Hafsa, Sauda, they're all really different. Some of the ulama have said that one of the wisdoms and the benefits of the prophetic polygamy is that if it had only one wife, that would have been the model of personality perfection for every Muslim woman forever. If it had only been Aisha, everybody would have said, I have to be like Aisha, I can't be like Aisha, I'm no good. In the Christian context, this is an issue for the feminist, where there is only the Virgin Mary. St. Ambrose said, alone of all her sex, she pleased the Lord. You have to be like the Virgin Mary, meek, meek and mild and, and uh, quiet and passive, be it done unto me according to thy will. Well, that's one feminine possibility, and Islam does give you that possibility, but there's others as well. So the multiplicity of these perfect women, these Ummahat and Mu'mini, actually uh, deconstructs the idea of there being one eternal feminine, one way in which all women have to be. They're, they're really diverse. Um, it's a, quite an interesting perspective. So we do have these mothers of the believers, which you don't get in early Buddhism or early Christianity or in the story of Moses. So it's kind of a distinctive feature of Islam that you have this kind of the, the 12 apostles of female and all different, and some of them you know, really strong personalities. Maybe Aisha, the strongest, she answered back. She was even though married really young, she was kind of a very independent personality and she didn't just go into quiet retirement after her husband died, uh, after nine years of amazing marriage, but you know, she wanted to be out there. Um, we'll talk about that in due course. So we have these positive role models. Does anybody, at least from the Atlas Sunnah, ever dare to criticize any of them? You know, as, as moral, perfected, saintly women. Of course not. We have that core, um, that female core, which is quite unlike, say, the biblical story. Open any text on Christian feminist theology and they're all grumbling about the Bible. Uh, bad women, femme fatale, scarlet women, who bring down the whole story, beginning with their rather unpleasant view of Sayyidatna Hawa, Eve and how she's responsible for original sin and everything, which is not our position at all. Uh, temptresses like Delilah, um, like Jezebel, the witch of Endor, there's lots of them. Um, generally, the female conspicuous characters in uh, the Bible are kind of negative, femme fatale, temptress type figures, and those stories don't exist. The only one that does exist is, of course, Imra Atul Aziz, Potiphar's wife. But even that, you know, she's not really depicted as somebody evil. She's just kind of lost it. She's gone. She's beautiful. Uh, it's kind of... And the women, when she's, they see him, they cut their hands because they're so amazed. It's really about love and the crazy things that lovers do rather than about wickedness. And, of course, in all of the... Muslim stories that develop that in the tafsir is you know, she ends up as a convert and maybe in some of them in uh, Nizami's account she ends up marrying Sayyidina Yusuf and so forth as a happy ending. Uh, so that's really quite a different understanding, the shift in the way these stories are told between the uh, sometimes quite concerning biblical archetypes and the, the Quranic correct, Quran, correct, correction of the stories tells you a lot about the Qur'an's agenda when it comes to uh, women. Even the Virgin Mary. Everybody's singing away in a manger at the moment. Christmas is in a couple of days. Well, uh, in John's Gospel, Jesus doesn't really treat Mary very nicely. The wedding of Cana, 
the wine runs out. And she comes saying, what can be done? And he says, woman, what have I to do with you? Which, however you translate it, is kind of not very respectful to your own mother. And this is an issue, again, for the Christian feminist. Well, one of the first things that uh, Satan Isa says is just born. Uh, when he says, well, baran bi walidati, uh, good to my mother. Uh, and those sort of negative stories about women are simply not present in our scripture. That has to mean something significant, that this new uh, dispensation is not going to say gender is whatever you feel like at a particular moment. Um, but neither is it going to say uh, that the woman is a particular stereotype of being a temptress and the authoress of original sin and the one who brought John the Baptist's head to Herod or whatever these biblical stories are. They're, they're, we don't get those stories. We don't get them. And that you know, has to be significant. Um, so it's not feministic in the modern sense, but it's not anti-women at all. And the fact that we have the, the mothers of the believers is very significant. Another aspect, of course, which is kind of part of the prophetic mystery, is the fact that whereas in all traditional societies, women were overwhelmingly valued for having children, what would the Virgin Mary be without Christ and so forth, uh, that's their principal function. With the mothers of the believers, we don't get that, do we? Khadija, radiallahu anha, has the four daughters. Radiallahu anhu. Amazing. What a household that must have been. Only one of them outlives him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and only by six months. Um, otherwise, this corner in the mosque in Medina, where they're all living, it's not kind of kids crying all the time. It must have been quiet and prayerful. Why? We don't know. Aqad kind of looks at this and speculates, why have you got these women, many of whom are young, not all of them? Um, there's no children. Although there is an account in some of the Muslim historians that says that Aisha, radiallahu anha, has a miscarriage. The boy is well enough formed to be given a name, Abdullah. Um, but that's it, and we know that was a great source of sorrow for her. But this is part of the divine you know, arrangement of the lives of these mothers of the believers, that they, they don't have children. And Akkad you know, goes around to a lot of doctors, and he says, well, what's going on? And he thinks, well, maybe the stress of the hijra, or maybe the, the malaria, which is endemic in Medina, which we know that Sayyidatna Aisha suffers from, maybe, maybe it kind of disappears in a cloud of speculation. It doesn't take you very far. But the important thing from this, whatever the divine purpose might, might have been, whatever, whatever that means, is that here you have a valorization of the women which has nothing to do with the fact that they have the son who is the one who it's all about. They are in themselves esteemed as mothers of the believers, that they're matriarchs of everyone. The Sahaba would say, Ummah, mother, when they passed one of them. They were the mothers of all of them. مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ The Qur'an says, Muhammad is not the father of any of your men, but he is Allah's messenger and the uh, seal of the, the messengers. It's kind of anticipated in this verse that this is something he wants, but it's not in Allah's taqdeer. So again, we have, and this can be very beneficial for a lot of modern women for reasons that are usually not their fault at all, don't get married. Infertility is more common now, all kinds of issues. We have this kind of population of Muslim women, and non-Muslim women certainly, you know, who can't find husbands. The Atlantic Monthly did a story recently, where have all the husbands gone, or something they called it. It's a phenomenon, childlessness, husbandlessness. And there's a certain kind of way in which the story of these women is a way of giving them role models and allowing them to feel that you know, the important things of life are still what they have achieved. Uh, the, the purpose of woman is not just to be um somebody. The purpose of woman is to be you know, herself and to follow the prophet and to be virtuous and to feed the poor, to be um al-masakin or 
that and Mitalqain or whoever it was to acquire these amazing titles. So that, it seems to me, is another interesting gift of this you know, enigmatic, curious, um, but inspiring scenario. Another aspect of it, I promised that it wouldn't be a lecture on gender, but kind of you can't escape it when you're thinking about the, the mothers of the believers, is that one of the shattering revolutions which Islam introduced into the wider Near East was the idea that it's okay to get married, which Christianity had said, well, only for kind of emergency situations. But the elites and the saints and the bishops and the priests and the apostles, they don't get married, not really. And it's still a big issue in the Catholic Church. The Orthodox Church, the priests can get married, but the bishops can't because the bishops have to be monks. The whole monastic tradition. فَمَا رَعَوْهَا حَقَّرِ آيَتِهَا The Qur'an says, of monasticism. They didn't observe it correctly. It's not easy to abandon the most fundamental human, biological, hormonal impulse to get married, to say goodbye to loneliness, to have children, to be part of the web of life. That's difficult. Uh, and it doesn't work particularly well. And all of these scandals which are tearing apart the church in the West at the moment are to do with the fact that you can't really defeat biology, not really, because you're part of biology. Some people may do it, but to make it a kind of rule as part of their sharia for priests, not working particularly well. And it's also, you know, it, it generates a lot of loneliness. You talk to Catholic priests, as I do sometimes, the worst thing about celibacy is actually the loneliness. It's kind of, you go back to your single bed at night in the monastery or the priest's house and just kind of, Nothing, there's no woman's touch in the house. It's, it's not easy for your whole life and knowing that there's no prospect of that ever changing. Uh, and we now have, of course, a ministry of loneliness in the UK, don't we? And most of the victims or the patients diagnosed as a medical condition by the NHS, most of them are women. So one of the things, and again, this takes us out of the sort of cultural possibilities of 2023, is that polygamy actually is the solution to that. Polygamy is a solution to that. And it's a primordial human institution. Um, most Native Americans before the Europeans rolled up accepted polygamy as a ma matter of course. In a traditional hunter-gatherer situation, the men are more at risk. They're more likely to be eaten by wild beasts while hunting in the desert, more likely to be speared by other tribesmen. You always have a surplus of women. Polygamy is the obvious way of, of preventing them from being lonely. It's kind of a fitri, normal institution. Even amongst the ancient Israelites, leverate marriage um, was, was an aspect of that. <coughs> so this is another way in which, as we get into our time machine to visit those times, we have to leave behind the kind of... <coughs> boy meets girl scenario and get into a space where it was understood boy meets girls could also work. <coughs> so it's kind of overcoming a Christian inhibited loneliness courting uh, environment um, of Egypt, Syria, the Christian world which Islam came to supplant. So Friedrich Nietzsche the idea of two fundamental principles, the Apollonian and the Dionysian, which is like the linear and the curved, the mineral and the organic, uh, the rational and the ecstatic, which he finds in early Greek culture, and then he finds the two separate out. And uh, he blames the modernity of uh, the Europe of the 19th century for being Apollonial, enlightenment, scientific, rational, <coughs> and the ecstatic, organic, uh, chthonic, feminine, <coughs> non-linear principle, he says, is being lost. And he's trying to figure out, is there a form of life in which these two things can be brought together again? Freud, of course, had understood that uh, the <coughs> Dionysian, Catholic, earthly is a kind of <coughs> subconscious above which is 
ratio reason. But uh, Nietzsche wanted to see them combined in a single form of life. <coughs> well, that's another thing to think about. <coughs> another thing to bear in mind is the, the strength that women in traditional societies had to have. <coughs> the men were out spearing gazelles or whatever, or each other. Uh, the women were dealing with certain biological realities, <coughs> which in those more or less paleolithic circumstances were really dangerous, life-threatening, excruciating. So here's an account from one woman from that time, which indicates that the female thing was not a kind of soft and easy option. سُئِلَتْ فَاطِمَ بِنْتِ الْخَرْشَبْ أَيُّ بَنِيَكَ أَفْضَلْ فَقَالَتْ وَاللَّهِ مَا أَدْرِي إِنِّي مَا حَمَلْتُ وَاحِدًا مِنْهُمْ تُدَأَى This is classical Arabic. وَلَا وَلَدْتُهُ يُتْنَى وَلَا أَرْضَعْتُهُ غَيْلًا وَلَا مَنَعْتُهُ قَيْلًا ولا أنمته تأدى ولا سقيته حدبدا ولا أطعمته قبل رئة كبدا ولا أبدته على مأقا <coughs> Most modern Arabs will struggle with this, but here's a translation. So she's saying she was actually lucky with her children. <coughs> Which of your births and babies was easiest? I don't know. I didn't give birth to any of them at the wrong time of the month, or as a breech birth, nor did, he beca- nor did I become pregnant when still breastfeeding, nor did I breastfeed a thirsty child in a time of great heat, nor did I have to make a baby sleep on a hard and stony place, nor did I have to feed a baby with meat from the lungs or the liver, which are difficult to digest, nor did I have to put him to sleep at night when I was angry and exhausted. Mm, traditional maternity really difficult. Uh, And as a result, the women tended to be really quite resilient and strong. If you look at the image of these women in the Sira, they tend to be, they're not pussycats, they're uh, strong, uh, determined women. uh, And that is the result of the fact that the the feminine estate and the biology leads them to (coughs) have to make huge sacrifices. To be a mother, especially then, required tremendous uh, resources of uh, uh, resilient uh, pain control, uh, sorrow control, dealing with hormones, dealing with postnatal depression and so forth. All of these sacrifices that women as part of the uh, of womanly nature are um, heir to as a result of the biology. And back then it was much more intense because... <laughs> There was no kind of daycare centre you could go off to, no nice midwife from the NHS who could give you a shot of something. They were basically their own midwives. <clears throat> so that's one explanation for why so many of the women in this period seem to be really forceful. Um, but the Jahiliya also, because of the culture, tended to victimise women a lot. In a place where there is no proper law or legislation or state, uh, women tend to suffer most. They're the ones who get abducted. They're the ones who are the victims of anger, of a revenge culture, of the vendetta culture. Um, uh, And again, this is one of the things that was transformed uh, by the replacement of the old feuding culture of the Arabs with the idea of the the Sharia. Uh, Aisha is... Well, and her father Abu Bakr from the clan of Taim, Bani Taim, who are famous kind of aristocrats in the sense of being people with noble qualities. Uh, they tend not to be warriors, they're more into the kind of trade and animal husbandry uh, business. <coughs> and you find generally Abu Bakr's family, his sons and his daughters, <coughs> really quite uh, dignified and strong people. You may recall when we were looking at the, the Hijra, the story of Aisha's sister, Asma bint Abi Bakr, that and Nitaqain, 
and how she was the one who kept the Holy Prophet and uh, As-Siddiq fed and watered in their cave when Quraysh was out looking uh, for them and you know, she had to do it by night, going out on her own with um, considerable quality, quantity of supplies, finding uh, her way to the cave. Um, mm -hmm. She was uh, really, <coughs> really courageous. So yeah, these are, these are strong women and the women from Bani Taim particularly well known from this. Incidentally, when I was talking about Sukaina, one of her best friends, Aisha bin Talha, kind of literary figure, um, <coughs> uh, another kind of aristocratic woman, a uh, very strong personality, um, uh, was also from Bani Taim and connected to the great early poet Omar bin Abi Rabi'ah, the great love poet of, of early Islam. So she's from this good family. She learns to read. Aisha can read. And because of the transformations that Islam is bringing, women are able to get into the mercantile space a little bit more fully because um, they have the complete uh, legal autonomy to buy and to sell and to inherit. In the Jahiliya generally, it seems, insofar as we can read between the lines of the sources, <coughs> women generally didn't inherit. In the Jahiliya, a woman could even be inherited uh, in the sense that... Uh, when somebody died, the women folk could be distributed um, in a will to uh, surviving male relatives, um, which is specifically banned by a Quranic verse. Ya ayuhal ladina amanu la yahillu lakum an tarithu nisa akurha. It's not permitted to you to inherit women against their will, which was a jahili practice, but also a kind of practice in some. Old Testament religion, this is the Leverate marriage, which is in Deuteronomy, which says that if a man dies, then his widow is married to his brother. It's one of the bases for polygamy in uh, ancient Jewish law. Um, there's nothing like that in Islam. Of course, you can marry your brother's widow, but it's just an ordinary nikah. It's not something that's presumed naturally to happen or something that um, she should uh, be resigned to. Also, these women, so Aisha is a strong personality from an early age, but she's also in a space where that is enabled more by the new uh, religious dispensation, <coughs> uh, where women are making independent kind of cultural and political decisions. So look at this verse. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيُّ إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُؤْمِنَاتُ يُبَايِعْنَكَ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا يُشْرِكْنَ بِاللَّهِ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَسْرِقْنَ وَلَا يَزْنِينَ وَلَا يَقْتُلْنَ أَوْلَادَهُنَّ وَلَا يَأْتِينَ بِبُهْتَانٍ يَفْتَرِينَهُ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِنْ وَأَرْجُلِهِنْ وَلَا يَعْصِينَكَ فِي مَعْرُوفٍ فَبَايِعْهُنَّ to pledge their allegiance, bay'ah, on the basis that they will not associate anyone with Allah and will not commit theft or adultery and will not kill their children and will not bring uh, some slander which they invent and do not disobey you in anything that is good, then give them the pledge of allegiance and seek forgiveness of Allah for them. Allah is ghafoor rahim we tend to pass over such verses, kind of like the men are doing, the women are doing, but this is strange for the ancient world because at no point does the verse say, well, look, where are the, where's the mahram, where's the husband, where's the one who's speaking on her behalf? The women are coming to the Holy Prophet, وسلم, some of them from families who are not yet believers, and independently taking this decision and making the bay'ah of the chosen one. The verse also, of course, indicates the wa'd al banat, the... Uh, prohibition on uh, female infanticide, <coughs> uh, which you know, famously is forbidden in, uh, in the Qur'an. <coughs> and uh, again, we underestimate the radicalness of these verses in the context of the time. وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَى ظَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًّا وَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ يَتَوَارَى مِنَ الْقَوْمِ مِنْ سُوءِ مَا بُشِّرَ بِهِ <clears throat> and 
And when one of them is given the good news of a baby girl, his face turns black and he is furious, hiding from other people because of the unpleasantness of the good news that he's been given. Will he keep her in a humiliated state or bury her beneath the dust? Evil is their judgment. Female infanticide still goes on today. It's a feature of many pre-modern societies. Matteo Ricci, the um, Italian traveller, when he goes to China in the 16th century, has some quite horrifying descriptions of what he found, that women, because they really didn't want female babies, would take them to the local rubbish heap. they just leave them there until they died. He saw this a lot. Or there would be baby towers, specifically for this purpose, attached to Buddhist uh, monasteries and nunneries. So if you had a female baby, you would take it and put it on a shelf in this tower, and it would last a couple of days, and then it would die. Uh, he was quite <coughs> appalled by this. In India, in the colonial period, of course, the British had to decide, do we get involved in the local culture or not? But they found, for instance, that uh, in the family of the Rajas of Minpur, there had been no living daughter for several hundred years because the female princesses would all be killed at birth. And so the British Empire and its kind of, maybe it's more well-meaning uh, aspects started to intervene. So 1870, uh, at Westminster, was passed a new law, the Female Infanticide Prevention Act. But it still goes on, the subcontinent, India in particular, is kind of the centre of this. Um, um, UN calculated that the number of female babies killed in the 20th century was the same as the number of casualties in the uh, Second World War. That's the, how widespread it is. So there's a documentary, which I think you can see on YouTube. It's a girl, the three deadliest words in the world. Which is why in India you have 100 million more males than females. Uh, not just because they're killed following birth, but selective abortion. You use the modern technology to determine the gender. It's a girl. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, this is a big change for the Arabs. We tend to say, well, obviously, it's still an issue today. Um, also, verses to do with kindness. <laughs> Live with them in kindness. And if there is something in them that you dislike, uh, it may be that you dislike something in which Allah has placed much good. Uh, so this is clearly part of the, the revolutionary agenda of the new tradition, and this is not some kind of modernist attempt to find modernity magically anticipated in 7th century Arabia. It's just a reading of the text, and it's in the Qur'an itself. Um, and the fact that the new religion's concern from the outset was really with the weak, uh, with the ethnically marginalised, with those who didn't have a family, with the orphans, with the poor, most of the early converts were like that. You know, women were generally weak in that society. It also meant that they were included in this. And very many of the first converts to Islam, of course, were women, some of the first martyrs like Sumaya, radiallahu anha. So this is the, uh, the context. We've been setting the scene for this extraordinary story of a world in which really that which defines Arab identity is being upended and negated by this new thing, that you're all equal as Muslims, brethren, that genetic term now applied to somebody who's from a tribe that you've been firing arrows at for hundreds of years and you're in the mosque and shoulder to shoulder and feet to feet and kind of really radical demonstration of that abolition. But also these new attitudes to you know, respect for women. It's not really equality in the contemporary enlightenment sense, it's a very new word and which tends to be problematic because the, how do you equate two principles that are really quite different? Uh, instead, you know, honour, respect, affection, these are more likely to be practical terms that, that you're going to be uh, finding beneficial. The date of her birth, just to go through the bio data, 
Historians are really not clear about the birth date of very many of the Sahaba. Some of them vary by about 10 years, and in those days nobody had birth certificates. didn't really matter very much. Um, uh, but we obviously know who her parents were, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, and the mother Umm Ruman, uh, her actual name was Zainab, or possibly Dead, from the tribe of Kinana, a widow who'd been married to his friend Abdullah bin al-Harith and already had a son by him. Abdullah dies and uh, Abu Bakr marries her. And in her conversion, her struggles, um, in the very early days of Islam, she made a lot of sacrifices and the Holy Prophet specifically praised her. مَنْ سَرَّهُ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَى مْرَأَةٍ مِنَ الْحُورِ الْعَيْنِ فَلْيَنْظُرْ إِلَى أُمِّ رُومَانِ Whoever would like to see a woman from the Huris of Paradise, <coughs> let him look at Umm Ruman. Um, we're not quite sure when she died. There's a hadith in Bukhari that seems to suggest that it's in Othman's caliphate. Uh, Aisha, we have some accounts as to what she looked like. Fair skin, it seems. Uh, one of the Holy Prophet's pet names was for her was Humaira, which means kind of pinkish, pinky. <coughs> Fairly tall. Um, her voice, similar to her father's, determined manner of speech. So whenever she was saying something that was really kind of strong and definite, uh, Holy Prophet would say, Inna ki ibnat Abi Bakr, you're really Abu Bakr's daughter. Um, we also know, or we can presume from the story of the Battle of the Camel, which comes later where she's directing an army from within a kind of palanquin on top of a camel. <coughs> Must have had a pretty strong voice to have been heard under those circumstances. We also know, this is part of her Bani Tamim background, Bani Tamim background, that she's really very literate. She's one of the great experts on poetry amongst the Sahaba. Makana yanzilu biha shay'un illa an fihi sha'ran. Whenever anything happened to her, it said she would come up with a line of poetry that was appropriate to that situation. Si- situation. <coughs> she had a nephew, Orwa ibn al-Zubayr, who's also going to have a significant role later on, who is uh, one of the great experts, kind of encyclopedic memorizers and catalogers of the poetry, Jahidi poetry and Islamic poetry amongst the Arabs. He would go to her for instruction and valued her greatly. And we have some poetry which is by her and poetry which she would recite at appropriate moments. She also becomes remembered as a Hadith scholar, Muhadditha. Um, narrates more than 2,000 Hadiths, tend to be in Sharia and related matters. Some of them are to do with fitan, akhir zaman, eschatological kinds of matters. Sometimes tafsir, hadiths that explicate particular verses. Sometimes in the explanation of particular words in the Qur'an, uh, which are difficult. Uh, and she becomes, uh, quite early on, but certainly after the Holy Prophet's death, a kind of scholar figure in Medina. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari used to say, مَا أَشْكَلَ عَلَيْنَا أَمْرٌ فَسَأَلْنَا عَنْهُ عَائِشَ إِلَّا وَجَدْنَا عِنْدَهَا عِلْمًا فِي Never were we confused by something and then went to ask Aisha, but that we found that she had some knowledgeable thing to say about that subject. Ata bin Abi Rabah said, كَانَتْ أَفْقَهِ النَّاسِ وَأَعْلَمَ النَّاسِ وَأَحْسَنَ النَّاسِ رَأْيًا فِي الْعَامَّةِ She was the most learned of people in fiqh and <coughs> the most erudite, and her opinions were the best opinions. Masruq said, these are all major names in early Islamic law and hadith scholarship. Ra'aytu mashikhata ashabi Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-akabir yas'alunaha anil fara'id. I saw the best and the most learned companions of the Holy Prophet asking her questions about inheritance. Onwa again. Ma ra'aytu ahadan a'lamu bi fiqhin wala bi tibbin wala bi shi'rin min Aisha. I never saw anybody who knew fiqh better, or medicine better, or poetry better than Aisha. Well, these are quite major testimonies from people who are beginning the science of hadith narration and whose you know, knowledge of Arabic poetry and literature is already 
know, pretty huge and oceanic. And they're all testifying to her uh, eminence in this regard. <coughs> it's a hadith. Not everybody believes it's a sound hadith, but it indicates um, a widespread early opinion. Take half of your religion from this little um, pale-skinned girl, or this little pink girl. Um, one reason why she is regarded as a major hadith narrator and reliable is that people can see that even though she is right at the heart of many of the early kind of civil wars and difficulties and tribal <coughs> legitimist disputes, uh, there isn't a single hadith amongst these hadiths that she transmits from the Holy Prophet which condemns her rivals. So that gives people confidence. She's not somebody who concocts things. So she's classified by the hadith narrator as a thiqa, reliable. Um, so generally the scholars record about 2,210 hadiths on her authority, second only to Abu Huraira. She's really very prolific as a narrator and uh, trustworthy. Also well known as a public speaker, also well known as a historian. Uh, she used to love Tawarikh al Umam, histories of the nations. <coughs> in any case, this is what she grows into in the Holy Prophet's house. Yeah, he's kind of encouraging all of this. So let's rewind, talk about the marriage. It seems to have been something of a surprise. He's been married for 25 years to Khadija, who's born him, his only four daughters, which was, <coughs> by all accounts, an amazing marriage. And then one day he said, Uri Tuki fil manami marratain. I saw you, he's talking to her, in a dream twice. Ara annaki fi saraqatin min haririn wa yuqal hadihi imraatuk. I saw you wrapped in a piece of silk and a voice was saying, this is your wife. So I took off the silk and I saw your face. And then I said, if this comes from Allah, he will bring it to pass. Know that the Holy Prophet والسلام, was devastated by the loss of Khadija. <coughs> and a woman, Khawla bint Hakim, having seen this, um, has the idea of bringing about this union. Um, <coughs> It seems, according to most of the historians, that she had already been betrothed in those ages when life expectancy was short, people generally married very young. She had already been betrothed by somebody called Jubair bin Mutaim, who wasn't yet a Muslim. Uh, and that Abu Bakr has never in his life broken a promise, but finds this difficult that he can marry his daughter to somebody who's not a Muslim. So she goes to Jubair's parents. The mother says, لَعَلَّنَا إِنْ أَنْكَحَهَا هَذَا الصَّبِيُّ إِلَيْكِ تُصْبِئِ I'm afraid that <coughs> if this young girl marries you, you'll leave your religion, you'll become Muslim. وَتُدْخِلُهُ فِي دِينِكَ الَّذِي أَنْتَ عَلَيْهِ وَسَأَلَ زَوْجَهَا مَا تَقُولُ أَنْتَ and she asked her husband, what do you think about this? And he kind of agreed. So Abu Bakr, hearing this, <coughs> knew that the kind of promise, the betrothal was at an end. So the, according to most of the historians, the khitbah, the proposal uh, to the Holy Prophet was completed about three years before the Hijrah at a mahar of 400 dirhams. <coughs> 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 he 
Here we have the familiar controversy, how old was she? And Akkad has a whole thing in which he deals with this uh, quite competently. Um, it's only been an issue, really, in the 20th century, because before the 20th century, child marriages were kind of normal. Richard II of England had a queen who was six years old. <coughs> William of Orange had a wife of nine. It was normal in the pre-modern world. Uh, uh, Catholic canon law until about 100 years ago said it, well, you could marry at the age of 12. Now I think the age is 14 in Catholic law. Of course, they followed the law of the land, which is usually later than that, but in principle, Catholic marriage is valid at that time. Um, uh, the Roman Empire, girls married at 12, etc. It's kind of an anachronism to say, oh, nowadays you can't get married until you're 18. So the whole idea of child marriages is kind of strange to us. Um, it's also the case, and Alcard does this uh, pretty well, that, as we mentioned, people didn't have birth certificates and the sources do differ. Um, so Alcard's theory is that Abu Bakr would not have betrothed her to a polytheist after he'd become Muslim, very unlikely. And therefore, she must have been in this world before his conversion. <clears throat> In other words, there's accounts in Ibn Sa'd and elsewhere that suggest she was actually older than some of the, the other hadiths, um, do carry some weight. And actually, she might have been about 14 when she was married, um, if you accept this view that Abu Bakr would not have betrothed his daughter to a, to a pagan. Here's quite an interesting chapter on that. Jonathan Brown, in his misquoting Muhammad, has probably the best general uh, description of this issue, pointing out how silly and anachronistic it is. Um, in any case, Aisha absolutely gets into this new role, uh, never says that she misses her father's house, certainly never regrets uh, the marriage, um, and her childishness is kind of part of the, the, the betrothal and would have been understood as normal at the time. So. Famous uh, account, وَكَانَ السُّودَانِ يَلْعَبُونَ فِي يَوْمٍ مِنْ أَيَامِ الْعَيْدِ بِالدَّرْقِ وَالْحِرَابِ فَسَأَلَهَا عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ تَشْتَهِينَ أَنْ تَنْظُرِي قَالَتْ نَعَمْ قَالَتْ فَأَقَامَنِي وَرَاءَهُ خَدِّي عَلَى خَدِّهِ وَهُوَ يَقُولْ دُونَكُمْ يَا بَنِي أَرْفِدَ كُنْيَةِ الْحَبَشَ حَتَّى إِذَا مَلَلْتُ قَالْ حَسْبُكِ قُلْتُ نَعَمْ قَالْ فَاذْهَبِي so a hadith that the Ethiopians were once playing on the day of their Eid um, with um, their weapons. They were kind of having mock fights. And so um, he asked her, alayhi salam, do you want to take a look? And she said, yes. And he says, so he um, placed me behind him. We were very close. And he was saying, cheering one side, dunakum ya bani arfida, which is an Arab way of referring to Abyssinians. Uh, until finally I got bored, <laughs> and then he said, have you had enough? And I said, yes. And he said, off you go. She's still playing with dolls, um, still playing with her little friends um, <coughs> in the period in Mecca uh, when it's just a betrothal and the, the formal um, consummation has not yet taken place. So there's a lot of stories of kind of fun at that time, <coughs> uh, jokes that the Holy Prophet would, would play uh, with, with all of his wives. Asra'u kunna lihaqan bi atwalu kunna yadan. Once he said, uh, when I die, the one of you who joins me soonest will be the one with the longest hand. فَجَعَلْنَا يَقِسْنَا أَيْدِيَا هُنَّا وَمَا مِنْ هُنَّا إِلَّا مَنْ تَتَمَنَّا أَنْ تَكُونَ هِيَا صَاحِبَ دِلْيَدِ الطُّولَةِ so then the wives started to compare hands with each other to see who's got the longest hands, and they all hoped that they would have the longest hand. Then they realized that what he meant was sadaqa. It's a metaphor, it means giving sadaqa most. So they envied Zainab bint Jash, uh, the mother of the poor, for her famous uh, <coughs> uh, generosity. But one thing that we do see in this world, and we've left the 21st century behind, we're looking at that world in terms of the realities of that world and the, <coughs> uh, the reality of, of how these 
two people were growing close, that she was uh, his beloved from an early age. There was actual love there. Okay, Montgomery Watts says, well, this connected the Holy Prophet to the tribe of Thames or Abu Bakr, and then uh, uh, Hafsa connected him to uh, Omar's tribe, etc. And you can see how that works. Uh, but uh, there's also love going on. Aisha ahabbu nasi ilayya. You would say, Aisha is the person I love most. And they, obviously much of their married life and their sort of close life we don't, don't know about, but there's plenty of clues. So uh, they had a name for their understanding, their intimacy, their mutual knowledge. They called it al orwat al wuthqa the firmest bond, that which bound them together, which made them close. Uh, so sometimes you would ask him, Kaifa hal al orwa ya Rasulullah? How is the bond, uh, ya Rasulullah? And he would say, as it always was, it hasn't changed. This is the idea that women need reassurance that do you love me, do you love me? I told you five times this morning already, do you love me? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so this was the word that they had for the special mutual understanding, which seems to have been very profound and very deep. And he's 53 and she's whatever she is, a teenager. Hard for us to imagine, but it's just a different world. And it seems to have been real. Uh, it was a very real and profound love and fondness that they had for each other. Um, this, in the context of the battle against the, the Christian cult of celibacy and loneliness and the absence of this kind of unique closeness with another person that's possible in a marital relationship, cl closer uh, uh, convergence of souls than is possible in any other human situation, uh, that uh, this is one of the triggers for what becomes the most profound overthrowing of really the literature of the world, uh, which is the introduction of the, the principle of love or mahabba into Islamic literature. <clears throat> Omar ibn Abi Rabi'a, who I've mentioned, is, is the, the first great poet in newly Islamized Arabia. And it's all love poems. Mm. They took the ancient Qasida, which was the standard long uh, ode of the ancient pre-Islamic poet, much of which is boasting about how fast his camel is and about how his spears chase away the rabble of the rival tribe. And, uh, but it begins with a kind of what they call nasib, which is an amatory or a romantic preface about his beloved and so forth, the beauty of his beloved, eyes like gazelles, etc., etc. Um, and the first great transformation in Arabic literature that happens as a result of Islamization <coughs> is that that nasib becomes the ghazal. It becomes a love poem in its own right, which the ancient Arabs had never done. And Omar ibn Abi Rabia's poetry is basically all about that. It sometimes talks about uh, how fast is my camel, and he does that. But the focus now is, is shifted, and it's about his beloved Layla, Salma, Nom, uh, and a lot of <coughs> outsider scholars find this strange. <coughs> Isn't Islam terribly stern and puritanical and inhibited? And why is it that suddenly Arabic poetry, when Islam comes, turns into love poetry, and this kind of doesn't compute with them? But for us, looking at these relationships, uh, it's kind of obvious uh, that in the prophetic household there is this, this incredible love. And the love that it's not, well, in a sense, there isn't profane love. But uh, because love is the per perception of perfection, which perfection comes from God. If you perceive beauty, if you perceive goodness, those are things that point you towards the divine. It's platonic love, if you like. And uh, <coughs> this overthrowing of the uh, severe Christian penitential view about attraction and, and marriage, one of the big transformations that uh, Islam affects in the Near East. And what we're seeing is 
with the prophetic household, not, not parenting, but a very remarkable com uh, combination of domesticity with spiritual guidance. They're kind of living together and he's helping with the cooking or the sewing or whatever it is that, that he does, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to the, to the hadith and his kind of household chores being done together. But basically he's teaching them Qur'an, he's teaching them fiqh, he's teaching them forms of tasbih. This corner of the mosque, which is for the women, is kind of like a zawiya and it's right next to the sofa. Sofa, which is where the male companions who are there just for dhikr and for Allah and have renounced the world, is the veranda which is outside the um, apartments of the, the prophetic wives, which are small. You can see old plans of the mosque in Medina and you can see this is the room of Zainab, this is the room of Aisha and so forth. They're pretty small. So the, the famous hadith where he's doing tahajjud at night and she said, I would have to move my legs up for him to do sujood. These rooms are small. Some Hordi said they don't have windows. The ceiling is so low that you can just stand up in it, but it doesn't even have that added kind of rest or relaxation coming from having a higher ceiling. The doors are not made of wood, but of sackcloth. It's really kind of austere monastic stuff. It's like a monastery, but <laughs> not a monastery. It's a very unusual thing in the world's religious history. And it's all Qur'an and Tilawa and Dhikr and the Holy Prophet giving them guidance. And it's like a kind of uh, zawiya, a teke, a spiritual retreat. So the husband is the murshid. And uh, beauty and love, which become the great themes of our sacred literature, uh, seem to be first cultivated in Islam in that environment. The idea of the the shahid and the shahida, the human being whose beauty and whose purity uh, recalls the divine qualities. Mm -hmm. The idea of the shahid, the human witness, is very standard in the Sufi poetry. Appreciating the lover as somebody who draws you towards the sublime and the transcendent. Also the proleptic libidinal, in other words, the idea that there will be love and romance and intimacy in paradise also makes this something sacred. Some Muslims nowadays find this a bit edgy and difficult because of what some would call the Victorianizing of Muslim sensibilities following the appearance of disapproving Victorian missionaries in India and Egypt and places in the 19th century. Everybody became very kind of puritanical and a shame culture developed. But this. <laughs> You don't find a shame culture in early Islam at all, or in very traditional parts of the Muslim world, this kind of inhibited anxiety about the body and its uh, natural functions, something that absolutely is not there in early Islam. Because all of these things are not just about the principle of life, but they're also about you know, paradise itself. It's a lived anticipation of the life of the blessed. So love and closeness as the context for the revealing of signs and also the closeness to the soul of the other. The qalb or the ruh is where the divine mysteries appear. The ruh is the great mystery. You've been given only a little bit of knowledge about it. Even he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is told. As with intimacy, married intimacy, you get so close to another person in a way that's not possible otherwise that you start to see certain spiritual signs and a lot of people in very good religiously oriented marriages have reported that that kind of thing so islamic literature from that time really becomes focused on love beauty love life it's celebratory it's what nietzsche would identify as the dionysian principle and not the apollonian Before he died, he was already putting her, radiallahu anha, in a kind of public position as what Aqad calls his ambassador to the women. So uh, when women came to him for bay'ah or to ask questions about religion, she would be present. 
sometimes when they were shy about certain women's issues, uh, they would come to her rather than to him for advice. Or if he felt shy, something very kind of technical about the women's thing was being asked out of his haya, his, his shyness, he didn't necessarily want to speak about it, um, but she would answer on his behalf. And this grew until men came to ask her questions as well. Sometimes they would write to her, and we have some you know, little bits of letters that she would send to people in uh, response to their uh, uh, requests for advice about religion. So there's a famous one, uh, a letter that came to her from Muawiyah, asking for some nasiha, some religious advice. And so she says, أَمَّا بَعْدْ فَإِنِّي سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ يَقُولْ مَنِ الْتَمَسَ رِدَاءَ اللَّهِ بِسَخَةِ النَّاسِ كَفَاهُ اللَّهُ مُؤْنَةَ النَّاسِ وَمَنِ الْتَمَسَ رِدَاءَ النَّاسِ بِسَخَةِ اللَّهِ وَكَلَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَى النَّاسِ Now this is a hadith that she chooses to send back to him. Whoever hopes to please God uh, by annoying the people, God will protect him from the annoyance of the people. And whoever hopes to please the people by annoying Allah, Allah will hand him over to the people. Okay, so I'm sure when he got that letter, he thought, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so the ascetic life, these really small apartments, and that heat must have been pretty difficult. كان لا يشبع من خبز البر أو الشعير لم يشبع من خبز ولا زيت مرتين في يوم واحد He would eat from the rough bread of barley but wouldn't eat enough to to satisfy him for the satiety, wouldn't eat his fill and never in a single day did he have both bread and oil together so this is the monastic life but different from a monastic life. Um, it's the monastic life, except that he has responsibilities towards the public welfare and that he has a family life as well. It's a very new form of existence. We should talk about what we can learn about this uh, famous or notorious episode called the uh, incident of the lie, Hadith al-Ifq. Uh, the Holy Prophet is building this new form of uniting the tribes of Arabia, and of course there's a lot of pushback against this. <coughs> uh, the leader of the opposition in Medina is the notorious Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, chief of the Munafiqeen in Medina, who is a leader of the Khazraj tribe, which is one of the, the, the two biggest tribes in Medina. It can't be disregarded. <coughs> like a lot of people, whose positions feel a little bit undermined by this new reality in Medina. He's kind of looking to re-establish himself, maybe even calling himself king of Medina. And one way always in which uh, you can undermine uh, rivals is through gossip, through the manipulation of stories, through claims to having compromising information, exaggerating things. So many people in Medina are looking for ways of undermining and destroying the new order. There are conspiracies to kill the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's very tense. Quite apart from the fact that there's Quraysh and the other tribes who want to come and wipe out the Muslim community. So uh, the leader of the other main tribe in Medina, Usaid bin Hudayr, tells the Holy Prophet about uh, the leader of the Khazraj and that he wants to be king of Medina. Um, and this event happens on the return from a campaign called Ghazwat Bani al-Mustaliq, uh, which is a hurried return because they know that Medina's truce with one of the hostile Arab tribes has expired. So they want to get back to defend the city um, before that tribe might mount an attack. And everything is you know, uh, hurried and chaotic. During this return, some of the different Arab tribes, even though they're all Muslims now, they kind of get tribalized when they're disputing over a busy well. Ibn Ubay speaks up and tells his Medinan friends, his Ansar friends, uh, this is what happens when you get immigration, basically. <laughs> these people are anti-immigration. They don't like the Muhajirin, these immigrants. 
هذا ما فعلتم بأنفسكم أحللتموهم بلادكم وقاسمتموهم أموالكم He says, this is what you've done. And it's almost like Nigel Farage talking. Okay. <laughs> this is what you've done to your own country. Uh, you've allowed them into your land and you've shared your wealth with them. And if you stop supporting them, they'll go, Ila ghayri diarikum. They'll go to somebody else's country. <laughs> uh, and when the Holy Prophet hears this, and again, he's always aware of the danger of people backsliding into Medina versus Mecca, tribes versus each other. Um, he summons him and Ibn Ubay says, swears an oath by Allah saying he never says such a thing. No, it's all slander, of course not. He's a good Muslim. So the, conter- the, the return from the Ghazwa continues uh, and they're in a hurry. There's also a sandstorm which wipes out the trail that kind of makes it even more difficult to get back. And quite close to Medina, they camp for the night. Aisha goes off to fulfill a need of nature. It's dark, obviously. And she's lost her necklace. And that can be quite a thing if it's a sentimental value. Somebody precious gave it to you. It's important. You remember things, buy it. It's my wedding ring, whatever. I'm going to call the best plumbers in the world to get down to the bottom of the sump and to see if it's there. And you, you don't leave it alone. Um, uh, so she's kind of going around in the darkness looking for it. It takes some time. She finds it. She returns. Uh, the caravan's gone. Uh, they thought she was in the palanquin, the howdah, where she would be shielded on the camel. And she's so light that they thought she's there. And off they went. So she's on her own in the uh, former campsite. So she sits down in the desert. It's quiet. Nobody there waiting for them to come back. Sooner or later, they'll spot that she's not there. Surely they'll come back for her. <laughs> and then uh, one of the Sahaba, Safwan ibn al-Mu'attil, who's a very you know, respected uh, Sahabi, had been riding behind the army, partly to guard it as kind of rear guard, but partly also to pick up anything that might have been dropped. And he sees her, and of course what he says is, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'on. Immediately the kind of difficulty of the situation, which he can't now escape, is evident to him. And he says, Ummah, qumi farkabi, mother, hmm? arise and ride. Hmm. They have to go by camel or they'll never catch up. Uh, and so only a few hours later they catch up with, uh, with the army. Uh, seems like an obvious thing to have happened. And Ibn Ubay again gets going and starts to say, Imra'at nabiyyikum batat ma'a rajulin hatta asbahat thumma ja'a yaquduha. He says, look, uh, the wife of your prophet spent the night with a man. Uh, and then in the morning, uh, he turns up leading her on the camel. And starts very cleverly through his contacts to put this... <coughs> this gossip, this slander around. And she goes back to Medina and she's sick. She has her uh, malaria again. It's really bad. قَدِمْنَا الْمَدِينَ فَاشْتَكَيْتُ شَهْرًا وَنَاسُ يُفْرِضُونَ فِي قَوْلِ أَصْحَابِ الْإِفْكِ I'm in, back in Medina, back at home, and I'm really suffering for a month from this fever and not knowing that around me everybody is dealing with this gossip, this claim. Her mother is nursing her. She doesn't know what's being said. And then a female relative tells her, and she says, to maradan ala maradi. Then I felt even sicker. Uh, she went back to her room. She couldn't sleep all night. The Munafiqun have created a very clever, complex, lifelike story, spread it around the city. Aisha goes to her parents. They don't really know how to deal with this. There's no cameras. There's no GPS on people's mobiles and how you track people's movements nowadays. It's what, what it is. It's clear, though, that she's been set up. The Holy Prophet's also unhappy, but he refuses to accuse her. But he has a difficulty here, because he can't just, on his own initiative, say, I excuse her, she's innocent. Not possible. Because Ibn Ubay is hoping for him to do that, because then he could say, oh, this abolition of tribalism and kinship ties and so forth, uh, yeah, when it's his wife that's involved, he's going to disregard all of that. If it was some other woman, he wouldn't do this. So this is all nonsense. 
uh, come to me is this idea of equality uh, amongst the tribes isn't going to work. And the Holy Prophet kind of understands that. He's establishing an order in which everybody is equal ethically and before the law. And just to override that and say, oh, she's innocent, go away. Uh, he can't be guilty of favoritism, even though it is it is beloved, the woman he trusts more than anybody else. So uh, how is he to deal with this? How is she to deal with this? Um, again, she's in tears. And then, فَأَخَذَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ مَا كَانَ يَأْخُذُهُ عِنْدَ نُزُولِ الْوَحِي فَلَمَّا سُرِيَ عَنْهُ إِذَا هُوَ يَضْحَكُ وَإِنَّهُ لَيَنْحَدِرُ مِنْهُ الْعِرْقُ مِثْلُ الْجُمَانِ And then, when the Holy Prophet doesn't know what to do, he can't say she's innocent because that's overturning the normal judicial and ethical processes. But he's not going to say she's guilty. It's kind of, the situation is a stalemate. Divine revelation comes. Mm. That came to Allah's Messenger, that which would come to him at the, whenever the revelation descended. And when that revelation was lifted from him, he was laughing, smiling, huh? and the sweat was pouring from him. Mm. And the first thing he said was, Ya Aisha, Amma inna Allah qad barra'aki. Allah has declared that you are innocent. Uh, so that was kind of the end of one of the big crisis moments. But kind of, again, it's this tribal thing having to be suppressed, but uh, putting you know, the, the new leadership in extraordinarily difficult situation. And then there's a divine revelation which indicates uh, her value and which also indicates you know, that this was uh, the new religion actually breaking this kind of stalemate. Um, but it, it did hurt her, certainly. Very difficult, very difficult time for her. Holy Prophet dies, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it's an indication of his particular love for her, that he dies in her room with his head on her lap. This is a great catastrophe of her life, and really the great catastrophe of Muslim history and of all history. Um, and it was her test. He was no longer there, but he had taught her the sacred virtues the characteristically Islamic virtues, which are the opposite of the Jahili virtues of uh, emoting, uh, the virtues of Rida and Sabr and Taslim. Islam is all about accepting the divine decree and not overreacting or becoming excessively emotional. That doesn't mean that you don't weep and you don't do the normal human mourning things, but it does mean that you can't defy Allah's decree. It's profoundly consoling, of course, to people to know that this is for a divine wisdom which we can't understand. That's the best way of consoling the bereaved. But still, she is his, his uh, beloved and she's shattered. وَجَدْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ It's her description. يَثْخُلُ فِي حِجْرِ فَذَهَبْتُ أَنظُرُ إِلَى وَجْهِهِ فَإِذَا بَصَرُهُ قَدْ شُخِصَ وَهُوَ يَقُولُ بَلِ الرَّفِيقِ الْأَعْلَى فِي الْجَنَّةِ فَقُلْتُ خُيِّرْتَ فَاخْتَرْتَ وَالَّذِي بَعَثَكَ بِالْحَقِّ So she said, Holy Prophet's head was in my lap and I felt it becoming heavier. And I looked at his face and his eyes were turned up and he was saying, rather the highest companion in paradise. And I said, you've been given the choice and you have made the choice. By him, in, uh, by him who sent you with the truth. He died in my lap, she said. I was not wronging anybody. And then I placed his head on the pillow and stood to grieve with the other women and slapping my face. And if that's normal, certain forms of grieving and uh, mourning are kind of natural, spontaneous things and shouldn't be suppressed because it's almost a biological reflex. But it's the rebellion against Allah's decree um, which the Holy Prophet had warned against. She wasn't present at his burial. Again, you can always see these tribal things. They're kind of, even though this momentous thing has happened, they're already discussing, do we dig the grave the Medinan way or the Meccan way? The Medinan way is flat at the bottom, the Meccan way has a little curve 
that still thinking about this. In the end, their wisdom prevails, and it's a kind of combination of the two. ما علمنا بدفنه صلى الله عليه وسلم حتى سمع أن صوت المساء في جوف الليل. Women were saying we didn't know that he was being buried until we heard the the, the shovels in the darkness of the night. Then after his death, uh, even when the treasury becomes full and she is given a pension, she doesn't leave that place. He's buried in her room. She could have gone off to some nice villa in some of the more affluent sub- suburbs of Medina, like Al Aqiq, Al Sunnah, but she stays there, um, feeling that he is still in her house, feeling that he's still with him. And when they saw this, uh, people realized why the Holy Prophet's wives could never marry again. He was still there in some way. In dreams, she would do tasbih there, she would be reading Quran. Uh, and then when Abu Bakr, two years later, is buried by his side, of course, she's got her father and her husband in her house, in her bedroom, basically, although there's a small screen. Then when Omar is buried, she moves into the next room because Omar is not mahram. So she really felt the kind of ongoing presence. We don't know what the spiritual connection was because generally in Islam these things are regarded as incommunicable, but she certainly didn't want to leave. So in the day she would be in the mosque teaching behind a screen with all these hadiths and fiqh, and then she would go to the grave and offer her tasbih and prayers or do some housework. She grew very close to Hafsa during the first caliphs. Um, um, and then we've got time for uh, sort of political uh, events before we finish. Uh, Of course, Othman's reign is a time of unease for many. We've done a class on Othman, and what we saw was that he's one of the most beloved companions of the Holy Prophet who marries two of his daughters, one after the other one dies, and he marries the other, Ruqayya, I think. Dundurain, Holy Prophet calls him the man of the two lights. Um, uh, Othman's political strategy has been I'm now controlling this enormous new country most of the population are not Muslim most of them are different kinds of Christian or Zoroastrian this is not easy the Arabs are coming out of their Jahiliya but a lot of the tribesmen are still kind of tribal rather than thinking in terms of Islamic equality there are all kinds of different ideas as to how I should be and who I should appoint. And his conclusion seems to have been that the best thing to do is to appoint people who he really knew and who he was related to, even if they weren't sort of pillars of piety, because he knew he could rely upon them to keep the thing together. So he would appoint family members to key governorships in Egypt, Basra, um, uh, and so forth, and this generated resentment. People thought, no, it's the most pious who should be in these positions, not people who he can rely upon because they're cousins. It looked like nepotism. To some, it looked like the recrudescence of the old Arab tribal thing, and that really triggered a lot of people. <clears throat> so here, the sources have been filtered by later generations so much that we can't really tell exactly what happened, except that we know that uh, that Aisha also, uh, she went to Othman, who's still in Medina, of course, the capital hasn't moved to Damascus yet. She goes to him holding one of the sandals of the Holy Prophet, telling him that in these appointments, he seems to have departed from the Sunnah. Some people said, why are women getting involved? <laughs> women in politics, certainly not. While well, others took her side. She's not saying he should be deposed. He's just saying that these appointments of family members might seem to make sense in terms of the exigencies of real politic, but um, a lot of people are getting really unhappy. Uh, And then in Egypt, Othman's governor, Abdullah, faces an accusation that he's wrongly uh, wrongly executed someone. So now the Egyptians come to Aisha's house to complain. She's kind of the symbolic center of probity and uh, authenticity in the city and she's the one who finds all of these people are coming to her so she writes to the caliph 
And she becomes, although she doesn't mean to be, kind of the center of political opposition in Medina. Some of Othman's advisors think she's the main troublemaker, she's the main enemy, even though she's just trying to relay and process and understand complaints. This nasiha is an Islamic obligation. Instability grows. The empire is still expanding, but there's kind of a, a division at the heart of it. And famously, Othman's house is besieged. There's kind of rioting in Medina. His food and his water are cut off. Um, her sister wife, Um Habiba, goes with a mule and a skin of water, and uh, she's kind of almost attacked. Her mule is kind of... The, the rain is cut with one of the besiegers' swords, and she falls off. Um, <coughs> so Aisha decides to leave Medina goes to Mecca for the pilgrimage. <coughs> and again, exactly what happens in Mecca is really difficult to discern uh, because the subsequent historians, they're from the Bani Umayyah or the Abbasids or from different Shia groups or from, or from and everybody's telling the story that they have uh, heard uh, and regard as being most valid and... Um, uh, if you look at modern historians, they take all kinds of different views. But certainly, Mecca is divided between the followers of Othman and the followers of the Banu Umayya, uh, which she doesn't relate to either. Then she hears of Othman's assassination, and she immediately says, these culprits, because even though she's been criticising Othman, she really can't stand this idea that he's been assassinated, have to be dealt with. And so she gains, she, she gathers supporters in Mecca and heads north. Um, <coughs> Ali has been declared the new caliph. She's not against him, but she does think that he should be taking more stringent steps to track down and punish the assassins, who are mostly tribesmen who've vanished. And Ali thinks that it would be divisive to try and track them down. That seems to have been the, the situation. And of course, he's not part of it because his own son, Imam al-Hassan, has been one of the guards of Othman's house and was wounded during the attack. His, his loyalties are very clear. And he hadn't wanted to be Khalifa at first, but really had to be pressed when told, otherwise this whole thing is going to fall to pieces. This is like a civil war incipient. You have to do it. So out of a sense of duty, he relu reluctantly accepts it. So in... Mecca, there's people who are opposed to Ali, which he isn't really. There's uh, Talha and Zubair, who's a brother-in-law. Uh, each of them thought perhaps they should be Khalifa. And again, it's not really a matter of ego, but a matter of it's my responsibility to try and sort this out, because Omar had commended them both and said both of them would be um, suitable to be rulers. The Holy Prophet had died. Wahu and Omar once in Aisha's house had brought Talha and Zubair, according to the historians, and said, when Allah's messenger died, he was pleased with you. So it's a really disunited army with people from different views and different factions. And uh, uh, all the only thing they did agree on was that the killers of Othman should be brought to justice. So she sets out, almost turns back, um, indecisive, but she ends up in Basra, year 36 and uh, again uh, confusing stories it's a fairly lawless situation um, Ali has not arrived yet um, the two, there's the two armies a tent pitch between the two where the negotiations are taking place Aisha wanted a council to decide who was the right caliph? Would it be Ali? Would it be Talha, Zubair, somebody else? Uh, she thought there should be a renegotiation of that. Um, both sides, certainly Ali and Aisha, wanted a peaceful resolution, but they were extremists on both sides. The discussions seemed to have been going very well when some extremists on both sides started trading arrow shots with each other and um, everybody felt confused, divided, and a kind of um, battle uh, ensued. 
uh, the Battle of the Camel because she was in the middle of it with her palanquin uh, trying to direct things in this chaotic world. And it's not a huge battle by modern standards. Um, and it's not a huge battle by the standards of, say, the Battle of Yarmouk, one of the huge battles that the Sahaba had been engaged with against um, neighbouring empires. But it's still very painful. <coughs> Ali's forces, which are larger and more united, win Afterwards, he's startled when he goes around the battlefield to see how many great companions have been in her army. Um, Ali orders her brother, Muhammad, to take her back to Mecca. And later on, uh, all the sources agree that she's kind of really sorry that she took part in this battle that kind of was a spontaneous conflagration in a chaotic situation. So she'd say, Later, ni mitu qabla yawm al-jamal. If only I died before the day of the camel and she would not be able to suppress herself from, from crying whenever the battle was mentioned. So she dies on the 17th of Ramadan in the year 58 of the Hijra. Her janaza is led by Abu Huraira, and she's buried in Al-Baqiyah. Now I want to conclude just by going back, I know this has been a long session, um, but I think you'll agree that there's a lot that's important for Islam, uh, in this, in terms of politics, in terms of Islam's battle against tribalism, in terms of gender, a lot rides on, on this story. By looking again at another of the books which we have, Hooray, in the CMC library, uh, <laughs> in terms of this question of what does it mean to be a mother of the believers? Allah is saying that they are the mothers of the believers, although they don't have children. What does that mean? So. Different scholars historically, and sometimes this can seem a rather artificial exercise, like to rank the Sahaba. So-and-so is better than this person, and he did this, and the kind of like league tables, like Cardiff University is better in humanities this year than University of York. And uh, to me, uh, it seems a little bit artificial, because how can you really compare Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah to as Zubair ibn al-Awwam, they had different virtues, different drawbacks, different experiences. It's very hard to put them in these kind of complicated league tables. But interestingly, uh, Ibn Hazm has this book. Risala fi al-Mufadala bain al-Sahaba, an epistle on the uh, grading, the, mute, the, the different merits of the Sahaba. Ibn Hazm is this 11th century Andalusian scholar who's a Zahiri, very literalist, and that kind of impels him to do this. I want to see if all of these, he's got several hundred Sahaba, if I can actually create an exact list. Um, this all comes out of the initial disputes. Who is right, who is wrong in these? You know, should you criticize the Sahaba? Um, the Sunni position is you love all of them, even though their ijtihads might not always have been infallible. Um, but that's the Sunni ethical insight. You love all of them and their disputes leave them to Allah because Allah knows what their intentions are. The Khawarij and the Shia, Ibadiyya and other traditions do have ways of condemning some of the Sahaba which the Sunnis have um, shown their ethical mettle by saying, no, kulluhum odol, all of them upright witnesses or 100,000 of them. And that becomes characteristic of what it is to be a Sunni. Ahl um, sunnah wal jama'ah. Anyway, here is Ibn Hazm. And of course he has to deal with the question of Fadlu azwajin nabi ala sa'ir sahaba He actually says it. Huh? The superiority of the Prophet's wives over the other companions. All right. And he has various uh, ways of doing this. فأوجب الله تعالى لهن حكم الأمومة على كل مسلم. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala makes them they has have the the fiqh position of motherhood over every Muslim. وهذا سوى حق إعظامه النبي صحبة للرسول الله. That's in addition. To their merit from being companions of the Holy Prophet. Allah 
وَلُطْفِ الْمَنْزِلِ مَعَا So they have the merit of the other Sahaba, but that they have the special virtue of being particularly close to him, having kept his close company and having lived with him. وَالْحَزْوَةِ لَدَيْهِ And being favoured by him, مَا لَيْسَ لِأَحَدٍ مِنَ الصَّحَابَ That which no other Sahabi can, uh, can rival. So... <laughs> So he does this, um, his conclusion is that they're Sahabas, but also mothers of the believers, so they're better than the other Sahaba. And then, uh, then of course, in his kind of logic chopping way, he wants to know which of the wives are the best wives. And he concludes, أَفْضَلُ أَزْوَاجِهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ Aisha wa Khadija. The best of his wives were Aisha and Khadija. لِعَظِيمِ فَضَائِلِهِمَا Because of the great merits. وَلِإِخْبَارِهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَنَّ عَائِشَ أَحَبُّ النَّاسِ إِلَيْهِ And because he said, Aisha is the most beloved of people to me. وَأَنَّ فَضْلَهَا عَلَى النِّسَائِكَ فَضْلِ الثَّرِيدِ عَلَى سَائِرِ الطَّعَامِ It's another famous hadith. The merit of Aisha over other women is like the merit of kind of meat broth over other forms of food. وَقَدْ ذَكَرَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ خَدِيجَ بِنْتْ خَوَيْلِدْ فَقَالْ أَفْضَلُ نِسَائِهَا مَرْيَمُ بِنْتُ عِمْرَانْ وَأَفْضَلُ نِسَائِهَا خَدِيجَةُ بِنْتْ خَوَيْلِدْ The best of its women, Maryam, daughter of Imran, and the best of its women, Khadija bint Khawailid. مَا أَسَابِقَةِ خَدِيجَ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ وَثَبَاتِهَا Taking into account also <coughs> Khadija is coming first in Islam and her steadfastness. And then he goes through the other wives. So we don't have to accept everything Ibn Hazm says, but it's interesting that this could have been a concept in medieval Islam, that you have the Holy Prophet وسلم, and beneath him you have these 12 female apostles, and then you have the rest of the Sahaba. It's an indication of how the civilization really uh, revered them. And then finally, I wanted to read a few texts about her kind of <coughs> devotional life because I've mentioned that this, these apartments were like a zawiya. They were there doing tasbih and reciting Qur'an and learning fiqh. <coughs> so, last text today. <coughs> Abu Nu'aym al-Isfahani dies in 430 of the Hijra. <coughs> famous student of Al-Hakim and Nisapuri, Ibn al-Salah, one of the great hadith experts, <coughs> calls him one of the seven great scholars of Islam. <coughs> he has this ten-volume work, Hayyatul Awliya wa Tabaqatil Asfiya, The Adornment of the Saints, <coughs> in which he talks about the great ones of early Islamic history before his time, <coughs> with all of his isnads, and gives us narrations about them to do with their kind of spiritual life. And he has a long section on Aisha near the beginning. <coughs> Let's just read a bit of this before we conclude. ومنهم الصديقة بنت الصديق الأطيقة بنت الأطيق حبيبة الحبيب وأليفة القريب سيد المرسلين محمد الخطيب المبرأ من العيوب المعرات من ارتياب القلوب لرؤيتها جبريل رسول علام الغيوب عائشة أم المؤمنين رضي الله تعالى عنها And amongst the saints is the Siddiq, a daughter of the Siddiq. Al-Atiqa bint al-Atiq, which means the liberated one, daughter of the liberated one, liberated from um, unbelief, liberated from uh, attachment to the world. The beloved of the beloved, the intimate of he who is close to God, the one who is declared to be innocent of faults, the one uh, 
from the doubt of people's hearts, she was declared to be innocent. The one who actually saw Jibril, the messenger of the Noah, of the messenger who was the Noah of the unseen worlds, Aisha, mother of the believers. So already we get these titles. كانت للدنيا قالية وعن سرورها لاهية وعن فقد أليفها باكية. She turned away from this world, was indifferent to its uh, worldly pleasures, uh, and wept when the ones who were closest to her uh, were lost to her. <coughs> then he comes up with a Sufi saying, indicating what kind of mystical virtue she represents. In the tasawwafa mu'anaqatul hanin wa mufaraqatul anin. Sufism is to embrace one's yearning hmm, and to abandon uh, dismay or regret or moaning. In other words, just to accept things as they come. <coughs> and then he gives you a bunch of isnads and then stories about <coughs> um, her devotion. See if I can pick some out from amongst the mass of isnads. Okay, here's one. قال سمعت ابن أبي مليكة يقول سمعت أم سلمة الصرخة على عائشة فأرسلت جاريتها انظري ما صنعت فجاءت فقالت قد قضت فقالت ارحمها الله والذي نفسي بيده لقد كانت أحب الناس كلهم إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إلا أبوها It's a hadith indicating that she experienced more of the Prophet's love than anybody except for her father. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يخسف نعله وكنت أغزل. The Holy Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, while I was spinning, uh, would be fixing his own sandal. قالت فنظرت إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فجعل جبينه يعرق وجعل عرقه يتولد نورا. At that moment I saw the sweat coming and his uh, sweat, as it were, bursting into light. There was a kind of light coming from his face. Qalat فبهت And she said, I was astounded, dumbstruck. Qalat فَنَظَرَ إِلَيَّ فَقَالْ And he looked at me and said, مَا لَكَ بُهْتْ Why are you so amazed? فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ نَظَرْتُ إِلَيْكَ فَجَعَلَ جَبِينُكَ يَعْرِقْ وَجَعَلَ عِرْقُتَ and she described what had happened. I saw the light coming from your face and from this sweat on your face. And then she says, uh, if Abu Kabir al-Hudhali, who is a famous poet, saw you, uh, um, he would know that you were the one to whom his poetry would most apply. And then he said, and what does Abu Kabir al-Hudhali say? Remember, she's the great poetry memorizer. فَقَالَتْ يَقُولُ مَبْرَأٌ مِنْ كُلِّ غَبْرٍ حِيلَةٌ وَفَسَادُ مَرْدِعَةٍ وَدَاءَ مَغِيلِ وَإِذَا نَظَرْتَ إِلَىٰ أُسْرَةِ وَجْهِهَا بَرِقَتْ كَبَرْقِ الْعَارِدِ الْمُتَهَلِّلِ It's complicated, but it's basically about a face so beautiful that it shines like like the lightning. قالت فوضع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما كان في يده وقام إلي فقبل بين يدي. So the Holy Prophet put down that thing that he'd been doing, and he got up, walked over to me, and kissed me between my eyes, and said, جزاك الله يا عائشة خيرا ما سرت مني كسروري منك. And he said. May Allah reward you, Aisha. Uh, you make me happier uh, than I make you.
Yeah, and then there's this hadith which indicates that she actually saw Jibreel when he came. كانت عائشة أم المؤمنين رضي الله تعالى عنها تصوم وتصوم حتى يذلقها الصوم. Aisha used to fast and to fast until fasting actually weakened her. عن أبي ذرة قالت بعث إليها بمال في غرارتين. So a woman saying, once I saw Aisha, she had been sent uh, money in two large containers. قالت راها ثمانين أو مئة ألف. She said, I think it's 80 or 100,000. This would be dirhams, silver coins. فدعت بطبق وهو يوم إذن وهي يوم إذن صائمة. So that day when she was fasting, she called for a dish. فجلس تقسم بين الناس. And she sat down to divide it the money amongst the people. For Amset, وَمَا عِنْدَهَا مِنْ ذَلِكَ dirham. By the time the evening had come, not a single coin remained. For Lamma Amset, قَالَتْ يَا جَارِيَا هَلُمِّ فِطْرِي And when the evening came, she said, uh, please bring my iftar. فَجَاءَتْهَا بِخُبْزٍ وَزَيْتِ And she brought her a piece of bread and some oil. فَقَالَتْ لَهَا أُمْ ذَرَّةً So the woman who had come to her said to her, couldn't you, with all the money that you were distributing today, have spent one coin for to buy some meat? Nuftar Ali, for us to break our fast, قالت لا تعنفيني لو كنت لو كنت ذكرتني دنيني لفعلت. So she said, uh, "Don't be cross with me. If you'd reminded me, I would have done so." You can see these are really not dunya people. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Urwa said, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ عَائِشَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ عَنْهَا تَقْسِمُ سَبْعِينَ أَلْفًا وَإِنَّهَا لَتُرَقِّعُ جَيْبَ دِرْعِهَا I've seen Aisha dividing up 70,000 coins of silver uh, and then patching uh, the edge of her garment. <clears throat> yeah, then there's some other accounts about how she became uh, knowing about uh, medicine uh, that she she said that uh, towards the end of his life when the Holy Prophet وسلم, grew sick, um, the various delegations who came to Medina would hear about this and their own kind of medical experts, the physicians would come to try and help him with, with what he had. And she said she was watching and she was learning from that. And so I myself started to treat him. So I, I learned it from that. And there's other things that uh, Abu Nu'aym Rahmatullahi says about her, but I thought it was appropriate to end with this particular kind of aspect of this life of the domestic, the domestic zawiyah, <coughs> where he was alien and nursi dahakan wa He was the best of people uh, in laughing and smiling. She used to say. So it was kind of. Uh, evidently a very happy household, a very loving household, a very unique household, but one in which she was really being transformed into somebody who became a very formidable personality, a person whose life was basically <coughs> devoted during her 40 years or so of widowhood to making sacrifices for the community, <coughs> even becoming involved through her own personal had in the political life of what was going on. Uh, but also charity, fasting, Qur'an, becoming what they call, they call the turbedar, the, the custodian of the grave of the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that is a bit of her story, and there is a lot more, because she's a you know, private figure, because she's his wife, but also has this huge role in hadith transmission and in the development of <coughs> early Arabic literature 
and in uh, so many other aspects of the Muslim life. Radiallahu anha wa ardaha, inshaAllah we will be inspired by these examples and inspired also to overcome some of the prejudices that exist in our community about what women can do and what they can't do because the story of early Islam with women being at the centre of things, the Holy Prophet giving so much time and respect to them is something that we need to take, I think, a little bit more seriously in our communities. Wallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala a'lam. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.